Continuing on with our unit on groundwater, now we're going to talk about how it's set up underneath the ground. So we're gonna, I'm going to go over a couple terms with you and then I'll show you a diagram that'll make more sense. So the zone of saturation. So if you're saturated with water, that means it has a lot of water in it. So the zone of saturation is the layer of an aquifer that is filled up with water. And the top of the zone of saturation is called a water table. So you can kind of think about it like this. So here's a table. All right, and hey, look, here's water underneath the table. Water table. The water holds up the table. And then this would be your zone of saturation. Okay, whereas the zone of aeration, so you see here you have air. So air, there's air, there's no water. So this is the zone between the Earth's surface and the zone of saturation. So the zone of aeration goes right there. Okay, so here we have the diagram that shows us the different zones of groundwater. So down here, the part that sticks out the most is our aquifer. Aqua meaning water, so it's filled up with water or, wait for it, saturated with water. Therefore, this is our zone of saturation. And if you remember, our zone of saturation holds up our little water table here. All right, our water table also serves as the dividing line between our zone of saturation and our zone of aeration. Okay, so your water table, the depth of it can actually change depending on quite a few different things. So it can change depending on how much rainfall you get that day, that month, that year, what season it is, which can ultimately determine how much rainfall you're getting the slope of the land or the surface topography. Remember topography is like the lay of the land. All right, thickness of soil. Also, what is the soil made of? Is the soil in dirt and rocks, pebbles, sand? What is it? Is it permeable? So the permeability of the soil. All right, climate, which will also determine rainfall, time between rains, and then let me add a number seven. So we're talking the rate at which humans use the water. So that is what you see going on right here, this cone of depression. So we have put a well into the groundwater so we can get the water out of the ground. All right, so if we're using it a lot, then we're going to pump a lot of water out. And you notice, oh, look at this. Kind of looks like a straw, and then we have this thing called the cone of depression. So that's our decrease in water table that immediately surrounds this well. Lucky for us, our groundwater can be recharged. So a recharge zone is anywhere that water from the surface can travel through permeable rock to reach the aquifer and recharge it or add more water to it. All right, however, these places are environmentally sensitive because if water can get down there, so can pollution. All right, and salt water can also contaminate our groundwater. All right, so salt water intrusion, uh, or when salt water contaminates our groundwater, is actually a problem for us because we live near a coastline, or could be a problem for us. So under normal conditions, you see here we have our fresh water and our salt water, and there's actually this natural barrier interface that occurs between the two. However, when you stick a well there near the coastline and you pump out all this fresh water, you run the risk of pulling this salt water into the well or into the fresh water resource, the groundwater there, and that is called saltwater intrusion. All right, I've already mentioned a well several times, and a well is just merely a hole that's been dug below the water table to bring the groundwater to the surface versus a spring, which is a natural flow of groundwater to the surface. So this will, a springs occur in places where groundwater, where the ground surface dips below the water table. And I have a picture, of course. And then we've already gone over a cone of depression. All right, so in this top picture here, you can see again, oh look, here's our zone of saturation, zone of aeration water table, and here's the little cone of depression resulting from the pumping out of the water. All right, so you can see a spring over here. So a spring is where the surface of the ground dips below the water table, and it's just a natural flow of water to the surface. 
Now, when talking about wells, we talk about two different kinds of wells and springs, I'm sorry. An ordinary well and spring or an artesian well or spring. So an ordinary well or spring is where we have either the well penetrating in unconfined, like a just a permeable rock layer here, and then we have our aquifer versus an artesian well, which is where we have permeable rock right here that is sandwiched between two layers of impermeable rock, which is our clay. You should remember that from our lab, that Play-Doh was not permeable to rock. Okay, and impermeable rock is referred to also as cap rock. All right, a picture of an artesian well. Cool thing about an artesian well, if we have this here cap rock, all right, the water will actually come out without use of a pump. Hot water, hot water. So hot springs is just groundwater that's been heated by rock that has also been heated by magma. So when that groundwater rises to the surface, it produces this hot spring. And a geyser is just a hot spring that will erupt. Now since water is one of our main agents of erosion, and it also has the ability to weather things and break them down, there are certain features that result from this. One such feature is a cave. So caves are formed when limestone is dissolved by carbonic acid in groundwater. Carbonic acid is just formed by CO2 and H2O. All right, so stalactites are found on the ceilings of the cave. Stalagmites are found on the ground of the cave. All right, and a sinkhole is another feature that can result from this. So a sinkhole happens when the roof of the cave or the cavern collapses, and then we have this sinkhole. Unfortunate for some. Very unfortunate for these some.